I give Annie it to Sox. Hello, everyone. We'll give it a hey. We'll give it a few minutes uh, for folks to join uh, before we get started. Hi, Dan Kahn here, and um, 26 participants is pretty good. So um, I think we'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, I uh, wanted to introduce the group to Alex Salkever, who's a um, marketing expert who works with CNCF, and um, he has generously uh, volunteered, uh, perhaps not knowing what's ahead of him, to um, focus in on the first release of the white paper, or what we might come to think of as the first chapter of uh, the white paper. And uh, we're aiming to get a draft of that out in the next few weeks and get it reviewed by um, a bunch of folks and 
uh, to be released uh, at KubeCon November uh, 18th in San Diego or 19th in San Diego. And so um, the opportunity, um, I, I guess I would emphasize our interest in having um, telecom operators as co-authors of the talk. We're also very interested in feedback from vendors about the content um, and uh, to essentially ensure that we don't get anything wrong. Um, but we want to, I think, probably start with just some high levels about what CNFs are and how people are going about them. And then in areas where there's less agreement to, to try and list the different ways of um, doing things as opposed to being particularly prescriptive, uh, especially upfront. And so we're very, we would love to, in fact, we are planning to highlight a few um, telecom operators and the approaches that they're taking and would like those folks, if they can get permission, to be co-authors of the paper. We're then also very interested from hearing from vendors and other members of the community of, oh, you should also consider this alternative or this option or um, keep, you know, keep track of some of the positives and negatives uh, of different approaches. So um, Alex is going to be reaching out uh, to you, but I, I would encourage you, if um, particularly the operators on the call, to please ping me. Um, our, our hope is that it's going to be uh, Rakuten, uh, Verizon, and Vodafone, but it, it, uh, we're also chatting with Charter and Belcanda and a couple folks, other folks in there. Um, so with that, I think I would hand it off to Lucina and uh, Taylor to give a little bit of an update and um, maybe present those slides about exactly how the CNF testbed has changed over the last three months and then what the, the plans are for the next three months. Um, but then I would also open it up to uh, other folks who wanted to uh, add things to the agenda that we should have time for uh, other material as well. Um, Sounds Taylor, great, Dan. Yeah. yeah, and sorry, the last thing I'll just mention is that we are, yeah, I, I would appreciate if you and maybe some other people who were there could also give um, somewhat of a summary of the CNTT discussions that we had in, or that were had in Antwerp. And I am hard at work on finding two rooms for two hours each or a room for two two-hour blocks uh, that the CNTT can meet and, and, and Tug can meet in um during KubeCon in San Diego. So I oh, hope uh, most of the folks on the call will uh, be able to participate in that. Very good news, thanks. I can, I can uh, uh, say some words about CNTT and- Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So what was happened uh, week before last week is the, the second meeting of the CNTT, which was face-to-face -face and public to both Deco vendors and, and operators. And we agreed on to start uh, working on the, on the Kubernetes-based um, uh, reference architecture, uh, which means that we will describe uh, an infrastructure which is based on Kubernetes and which can support one or more uh, profiles from the reference model previously defined in, in, in CNTT. The initial uh, content has been already like pushed as a pull request, I think, last week, and uh, now heavily discussed. The <clears throat> there are like different views on uh, like how much should we consider Kubernetes as a full-blown um, NFEI slash infrastructure as a service. Uh, and which parts of Kubernetes covers from the etcnf mono architecture to overcome these, um, these like, let's say, mostly philosophical debates. We agreed on the meeting that we will focus on the interface, what the Kubernetes-based infrastructure provides to the VNFs, and we will not spend too much time on like if Kubernetes is running on virtual machines or on bare metal and or if Kubernetes can manage hardware or not. Um, 
because opening up this discussion would would like defocus the the group from from uh, the original aim of the of CNTT. Uh, other thing what we discussed uh, shortly and what sh what is um, what relates to what we are doing here is that we should like mm, separate the work in a way that we put most of the infrastructure related parts to CNTT and and direct the application related discussion let's say the like describing the the ideal cnf to the to the white paper but that, of course that's up to this group to to discuss also um other thing which is related to to this group is that uh, cntt would like to establish a working connection between these two groups in a sense that this group would let's say verify or review the Kubernetes based reference architecture, which is created by CNTT. And of course, CNTT invites all members of its group to provide contributions and comments to the content generated there. Gregory, I, I, uh, I'll just go ahead and say that, um, uh, you know, on behalf of CNCF, we're, we're happy to collaborate. And so I, I was assuming that these meetings um, in uh, San Diego that I'm trying to arrange would just be joint CNTT tug meetings. Yes, me too. Um, yeah, <laughs> Thanks and, for and that. All, all the docs, yeah, all the docs that we produce uh, will be open for public review. And so we, we would love to get, I, I mean, I, it's a little bit of a metaphysical question on, on whether the review is from you as a telecoms engineer or you as an official representative of CNTT, but we're, we're very interested in your review and feedback. Yes, thank you. I might, so my plan is that I will, you know, I will send from time to time this uh, or white paper to the CNTT mailing lists and I will send from time to time the content what CNTT generates to or uh, Slack or mailing list, so you know, just to initiate some kind of cross communication between the two groups. Yeah, I really appreciate that, and, and so I, I would heartily endorse that. Now, this is uh, Watson. I'd like to add that in the CNTT uh, multi tenancy was brought up multiple times, and it seems like that would be a good if we could create a user story or some requirements on how. Kubernetes can address multi-tenancy issues uh, for CNS, for the telcos. It seems like that would be a, a good place to to try to collaborate. Yeah, uh, great. I, 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 yeah, Sorry, I, I mean, I might just respond about that by saying that that probably is its own whole chapter um, of, a, of the white paper or whatever we wind up calling different sections, but uh, it definitely could both specify some requirements and then say what's feasible today with things like RBAC and then what things are coming down the pike and our alpha level features or we're not even shipping yet. Yeah, and, and, to, and to follow with that, like, I, I agree with that sentiment. Um, I, I, part, part of what we need to be careful with as well is like multi-tenancy itself is a uh, implementation uh, detail. And so we should try to work out what are the real drivers? What are the real things that they're looking for as opposed to saying, okay, we need multi-tenancy. It's like, well, you need isolation, but multi-tenancy is a way of doing that. So, so it would be good to get those, uh, those conversations going to work out. Like what are, what are the real drivers of, of the requirements as well? Uh, Great. I know one of the big drivers they kept bringing up was just regulations. So, um, having their users and their data separated, GR, uh, GDPR, and other things like that. I think, I think in, in general, it's GDPR, it's uh, any sort of regulation. Uh, also, operators typically classify their applications into security groups, and, and they would like to have separation between those. So uh, there are uh, VNFs which sort of live in a so-called demilitarized zone, which of course needs much higher security than others. Uh, 
but of course also uh, separation between individual vendors can be of an interesting point. So there are all sorts of reasons why, why, why operators would want to have separation and, 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 and therefore since the separation capabilities of Kubernetes as of today is not viewed as something good enough, uh, we are talking about multi-tenancy all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. I think we'll have lots of conversations on this. I just want to make sure it's that we have it on the table to understand the requirements. So, no, I think I think I think it's very relevant to talk about isolation and not just multi-tenancy first. So, I think that's a very relevant thing. And and also Kubernetes in itself, using you know uh, um, the capabilities it has today, has some multi-tenancy capabilities. So, in some cases, that's sufficient. Uh, then, of course, when is it sufficient and when is it not sufficient is really down to, you know, the exact country we are in, the exact operator, the exact, uh, you know, laws and, and, and rules that are applicable or the corporate level guidelines and, 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 and again, hard rules. So it's, it's like hard to give out uh, a clear recommendation because the requirements change country per country, operator by operator. Good discussions. Um, I'm hoping that we can continue. Excuse me, I got a cough. Uh, KubeCon with the two two hour blocks that we're uh, trying to get the rooms for. So appreciate your help on that, Dan. Um, there's a link to the reference model. Thanks uh, for adding that. I that's here in the notes for anyone who wants to look at the. Uh, the current uh, discussion on the CNTT side. Yeah, I think hearing this uh, this pull request, the, the discussion is currently more interesting than the content itself because uh, it's just you know the skeleton of the chapter so far, but it initiated lots of uh, thoughts from lots of people. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to make it through my update on that. So is, is there anything else before we move on as in the agenda? Hello, uh, I had a question. Uh, do you already yeah, know go ahead. on uh, which day will the CNTT and the uh, CNCF talk uh, should meet during the San Diego QCon? We don't have the date set specifically. Probably one of the dates will be the Monday, where there's all the co-located um, end oh, of day, and then we'll we'll figure out the others, and then we'll post um, in the telecom user group the mailing list as well as on Slack um, and notify all the different groups. So it shouldn't be one of the three days. You, you said it's the Monday, the day before. We're thinking that the first one, so we're probably going to do it over a, a couple of days, two of these meetings, oh, and the first one we're thinking Monday. There's a lot of co-located events happening Monday, mm -hmm. um, okay. and so I think a lot of folks are going to be, be there for those, um, and, and then look at one of the other days to continue. Okay, so there there should Those be discussions. Different, subjects, uh, different subjects discussed during the first and second meeting. The first and second meeting, yeah, or a continuation. continuation. It seemed like a lot of okay. the a lot of the conversations during um, ONS and CNTT, we had follow ups and a lot to to cover. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, um, so on the CNF test bed, we've, we've uh, been moving forward on the roadmap and I can actually bring that up and probably share my screen.
So for the folks who haven't seen this, um, the CNF test bed, um, we've been working to make it um, more usable for other parties to recreate. A lot of work has gone in to update documentation, making it reproducible, uh, specifically on packet right now. A lot of the use cases that were in there that were primarily based on Ansible and other custom scripts have been uh, re-implemented with either Helm or uh, YAML that you can use with Cupid um, Apply. And um, along with that, we've added uh, several uh, network service mesh use cases, including uh, one that uses a physical um, physical gateway, a physical net, a network card gateway. So we actually have the capability to do acceleration in, the, in that network function and connect other service chains. And we actually use that uh, during ONS as part of a tutorial, which there's links in the telecom user group uh, document as well as the, uh, this roadmap. Uh, all of these are clickable links to go through. And um, so a lot of it has been getting those building blocks in place with the new structure for other, to make it easier to add new ones and get contributions and, and then testing that out. <clears throat> this is our roadmap going forward. Um, there's probably some stuff that's gonna be shifting, but uh, this is covering quite a bit of it. So some of these are, built on some existing, we do have an IPsec use case, but what we don't have is uh, a multi-node setup with network service mesh, so looking at putting those in place. We've had a existing benchmarking test case that uses uh, IP route, simple IP routers, either IPv4, IPv6, and then use NFV bench to benchmark that. What we wanna set up is the same one um, and run benchmarks uh, with network service mesh and the new structure uh, that's easy to deploy on uh, Kubernetes and then be able to benchmark that. Uh, what I don't have on here, but listening to a lot of feedback was understanding the results when we are doing uh, benchmark examples. Some of these are functional tests and you're looking at end-to-end -end tests for results. And some of them are benchmarking, but the end uh, feedback was what are the results we're looking at and what do we expect whenever we run the test? So we'll be updating the documentation and kind of structure to make sure when you go into a specific use case and you have a set of tests that you can run with that, uh, what you should expect to get out of it, as well as working with um, different folks, including the FDIC set, uh, folks that have been helping to update some uh, ongoing tests that we're going to be showing those metrics on. In addition to that, we're uh, working to add DANM um, and some other different uh, technology like Multis and other pieces that we'll be adding in there. And uh, hopefully a, a GSM 5G use case like using the packet facilities that are connected to Sprint's network uh, towards the end of the year. And we have a call for help on the OpenStack side. We do support deploying OpenStack. Right now it's using Chef OpenStack. We'd like to move towards a COLA or OpenStack Helm and make it um, easier to manage and kind of match up with what a lot of the industry's moving towards. Uh, I know some of them may be the larger side, like Airship, but making it still reusable and, and easy to work with there. So uh, if Nikolai is available, I'd like to maybe hand it over to you and give you could give some updates specific on the network uh, service mesh and, and then maybe uh, Michael on some of the other updates. But Nikolai, are you there? <coughs> yep, I am. Hello. Can you please switch back to the roadmap? That would help me a little bit. Sure. Thank you. So, um, yes, the last, uh, I don't know, month and a half or something, we have been adding this um, um, 
very initial use cases uh, with NSM. We started with a very, very simple one. Uh, and then we expanded to external connectivity. Uh, as a result of this, uh, we had some um, like um, feedback uh, that is uh, very useful for our community. Uh, I, this, is, this has been uh, like uh, analyzed and worked on. And uh, actually, I think that <clears throat> the next uh, update from uh, Michael and Matthew, I think also on the code, is kind of related to what we found out. Um, it is more or less uh, regarding the fact of how you get packets in and out of, uh, of the network service mesh. Um, so um, we have one, uh, or, or let's say two probably more examples that are in the queue as the roadmap shows maybe for the next months. Um, and um, at least from my point of view, uh, and this has been shared actually on at the Open Networking Summit during the tutorial and during the session that we did uh, uh, about NSM and uh, uh, linking the CNF testbed. Uh, we had actually the most complex uh, NSM deployment that I have personally seen, like uh, probably, I don't know, uh, 20 or I don't know, 15, 20 uh, number of endpoints uh, connected and chained together. This is always, uh, again, thanks to Michael. So thank you, Michael, for putting all this together. Uh, and uh, mm, I have reached out to a number of people already. I'm really inclined to see this GSM gateway uh, or 5G. I don't know, we have to look uh, at what, what is available out there as an open source software uh, uh, that can be used uh, to, to Im Im implement this. So I would say that at least for, for me, uh, like, uh, uh, personally, and also from an uh, NSM point of view, I, I think that, that uh, probably this is the, the next big thing that I will be looking for. And if we can get this to some of the big conferences and shows, I think that this will be a win for all our communities. <clears throat> uh, this is more or less for me. If there are questions. Okay, Thanks, Michael. Nikolai. Thanks. And Michael? Yes. Yeah. Would you on. like to share your screen or do you want me to share anything specific? No, I think if anything, you can you can share the the CNF test bit GitHub um, potentially the the pull request that we have in there right now. Um, but just to to try and start out where where Nikolai left off, we we did the uh, the ONS demo where we we're showing this external gateway, um, and as it'll also be 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 visible from the documentation we added to that one, there were some limitations. Um, that we saw with running um, VPP inside a container with, with any external interfaces connected. Um, and, and what we end up doing is, is running the container in privileged mode. And that's something we, we kind of want to try and avoid both, both because of the security, the problems with this, but also just in general, it would be, be nice to have something where we have a bit more control over what's visible inside the containers. Um, and, and similarly, I've been, been working on adding this SRIOV network device plugin as an example to the test bed as well. Um, and, and this one is, is kind of similar in terms of, of external interfaces in VPP running inside a container. So, so what this plugin allows us to do is it allows us to assign a limited uh, or a subset of the, the physical resources or interfaces available to, to a container. But since we're running the container in privileged mode, um, from inside the container, you can still see all the interfaces and you still have the option of using them. So for now, we're using a somewhat of a workaround where we use the plugin to, to assign resources which are, 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 list, are listed inside the container and the environment variables. Um, and then we generate a configuration that matches the, the requests. So from a user perspective, you'll still see that you have the resources assigned and those resources will be available inside the container. But if, if you get a 
a CNF in this case that is that is acting somewhat on its own, it has the ability to take over additional interfaces. So so that's that's a bit of a limitation. And I think right now we're we're trying to figure out what we can do and bring in some of the VPP developers to try and see if we can find a way either through through a list of device mounts or Kubernetes capabilities to actually to avoid running the container in a fully privileged mode. So this is specific to uh, VPP. If you're if you're creating network functions using VPP, um, what we're talking about, if if you want direct physical access and specifically using VPP with the DBDK plugin, yeah, it is. But again, that's that's what we've been basing a lot of our use cases on uh, so far. All right. Um, on that note, if, if folks know about um, more open source uh, software that would be good for network functions that we should look at adding um, into the test bed so that we can use them in different use cases, then please let us know. Does anyone have any questions uh, before I hand it off to Gergay? One, one, one comment um, mm -hmm. about the, the privilege mode. So I think we should not say to anything which is running in privilege mode that is production ready. I completely agree. It's definitely only for, for I guess, environments where you have full control over everything that's happening. It's not anything uh, uh, production environment, that's for sure. I'd probably say that's in a general case, unless you made exceptions. Um, there are ways that you could isolate if, if we said node affinity or something, and you said these specific nodes are going to not have any other pods running on them. Um, you could get around it, agreed that that should be the general goal. And then if, if you were looking at exceptions on that rule, um, how would we do that? All right, any other comments or questions? Um, the CNF test bed. At, I think one of the specific things I didn't mention, which uh, Dan mentioned in the ONS keynote, is we're moving towards um, having the CNF test bed as a, a full dev environment anyone could use for um, working on use cases or uh, writing CNFs. Um, and then eventually being able to run any type of action uh, test for conformance um, to in collaboration with other groups. So that's kind of the goal. And if you have any feedback on usability or anything else, then please let us know. I think I think if we are talking about conformance testing, then then perhaps there is a need for a little bit more cooperation with with the C and TT activities, which very much look at the design reference architectures and mining. I think that we could be we could see the test for for having you know the the reference implementation for the cloud native environment. Just an idea. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be working with and uh, trying to collaborate on, with the OVP certification, and that's going to be tied in with CNTT. So there's going to be a lot of cross collaboration between all the groups. And what, what we're looking at is being able to run the test. I won't say right now what does that mean as far as everyone else, but we would like to anything that we implement in the CNF test bed, uh, we'd like to be able to say whether it passes or not uh, the certification and conformance. Uh, one comment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, is there any uh, plan for this kind of uh, uh, collaboration with the uh, OVP? Because I remember the first kickoff meeting, you uh, some guys said um, it's not going to be uh, any certification in the uh, near future or something like that. So I'm yes, not there will be collaboration. Um, it's definitely I've. Arpits asked, um, I've, I've had some conversations about working with, as far as the OVP certification. Uh, none of, nothing has moved forward on that. So this is real early kind of announcement that we're gonna be doing that, but we'll definitely be talking and working with all the groups to make sure what we're doing is gonna be able to support those plans and that we can run them and implement them and influence them if we have any feedback. Okay. And, and specifically, uh, and no OVP yeah. mm -hmm. uh, are all focused on VNFs right now, and so um, the the CNF conversation hasn't really begun in that group. But but we do expect to collaborate with them closely. Very early announcements, um, but we'll. Probably that could be uh, some conversations that we have at KubeCon. Looking at next year, what do we want in the certification? All right. Any anything else before um, going on to Gergay and the white paper? Okay. All right. So I think we partly covered what I wanted to discuss here. So um, if you would like to release something um, by KubeCon, we should uh, do some scoping of the white paper because currently it, uh, it's uh, like a very long in terms of um, um, like content list, but it's very slim in terms of content. So we should start discussing on which parts do we want to keep for for this first release of it and which parts do we want to release later on. And we should, I think we should start to do some more focused work on on the parts which I plan to release by, by KubeCon because that's very close to now. Yeah, pr practi practically we have this month to work with, uh, and and I don't know how do we want to handle the the, the review by CNTT whether that can be done before KubeCon or after KubeCon. That's an interesting question, uh, but I, I I fully agree. I think we have a very ambitious scope today defined for the white paper, and uh, and if we could agree on a on a a scope that we prioritize for the first release, then we have a better chance of finishing anything. Yeah. So, and this this uh, relates again to the discussion what we had in the in the CRT meeting with with Tomas that maybe we should focus on the like application aspects in the white paper and and uh, describe the infra things in, in CNTT. But that's up to discussion within this group. So at least from my perspective, having um, observed the progress or non-progress of the white paper uh, for some time, it seems that one of the reasons that it's not making progress is that it have implicitly has a scope creep. My understanding was that um, initially the goal was to, to define uh, how do, I mean, the, the gold standard for cloud native network functions look like and what is necessary from the platform. So basically limiting the scope to say, um, uh, uh, talking about the hypothesis, actually telco functions are not special, right? Standard Kubernetes platforms that are um, supporting sophisticated workloads from the IT industries should be sufficient and then discuss where this hypothesis breaks down and where potentially things need to be added. But what I see is that 
actually the most progress is being made on like adding a discussion of Etsy Mano, adding ARM support, um, uh, et cetera, which are not, uh, which I don't see as, as being the core of, of the message here. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. But and, and this is because we did not specify the core, you know, it like everybody could add a subchapter and like somebody added a, an Etsy NFE subchapter and I took the freedom to add content to it. Right, right. That's, yeah. that's I, I see this mostly like a lack of prioritization. Yes, yes. So, so it seems that we should probably first discuss kind of what we call the, the gold uh, CNFs and then worry about um, uh, I mean, the, how, how to extend that for, for the bronze or whatever it's uh, called CNS uh, later, right? I, 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 I tend to agree. I think there is, there is one more thing that perhaps is missing before defining the, the gold CNF, and that is um, what is the thing that we want to achieve with this transformation or, or, or with, with having CNFs in the telco context? Because I think I think the benefits of cloud native non telco context, I think that's all you that's already known. Uh, but I think it's important to match up the architecture transformation that we look at for the CNFs or for the from the VNFs going to the CNFs. Uh, the, the why needs to be understood. Uh, why is it good for the operator? What's the benefit to the operator of having CNFs and not VNFs? So I think that's that's the reason why I suggest that at least in the first white paper we should try to define the wanted position or or the goals of this transformation, uh, and I think that is one area where we could use the help of you know operators because the goals shouldn't be set by the vendors. So I, th I think that's a very good point, and if, if we consider that. At least in the I, in the IT space, uh, more and more use cases will be natively supported by Kubernetes. Talking about high frequency trading or media uh, uh, broadcasting or or some of the physics applications. So eventually, we will see features in Kubernetes proper that are also largely useful for telco functions. And the question is, like, one or two years down the road. Is there still a need to add telco specific extensions? Mm -hmm. And, and I think, think so. so I, I, see, uh, I, see a, I see a convergence between the so called IT workloads and the telco workloads. And it's not because telco workloads are not special, but it's because there are other workloads in the IT space which are yes. similarly special than telco workloads. I agree. Uh, and so, can we start with the hypothesis that telco functions are not special and, and compare about, compare um, how they are similar workloads in the IT space that have similar requirements. Uh, but I think, I think there is actually text in the current white paper that details the similar, similarities and differences between enterprise and telecom, which I yeah. thought was rather good. Thank you. So, I also like that text. It's maybe overshooting a little bit on the telco side because at least with things where the text claims telco uh, functions are special, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true. But let's look into that. I think what we need yeah. is first a high-level description of. Let's start from the hypothesis: there are cloud-native network functions that we want to operate and design as closely as possible to what the rest of the IT industry does with their special functions, not comparing mm -hmm. to web, but to other high performance functions. Um, I, I, I really like what you say, uh, but I, I think, I think the, the purpose of discussion or why I have brought up this, this item on the agenda is, is of course we could argue on, on what we should write in the text, uh, but I would like to, to see a proposal emerging in terms of a, uh, a prioritized table of contents for the white paper so we could get to work. And you see my proposal on, on, on the screen. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I took all the parts which seemed like relevant and are in good shape uh, and can be related to the topic of, of the transformation of the CNFs themselves. 
Uh, so I took the definition of the CNF, the similarities and differences between enterprise and telecom. Then I, I sort of suggested we need to talk about the goals. What is the goal of the transformation? And that, as I said, should pri primarily be coming from the operators. Uh, not just that, but that part definitely. And of course, uh, the idea of CNF and, and the design principles in how to make those happen. That's, that's again, uh, a chapter that is not yet written. Then when, we, when it comes to the importance of Ed Simano and management support, uh, uh, I, I, I sort of feel like that's a, a fringe topic and we might include it or not. Uh, when it comes to the ARM architecture, I think I like the text, but then I don't feel like it fits into this white paper that is concentrating on the CNFs because I think the, the core value and the core notion of being cloud native is to be agnostic to the infrastructure and, and, and there I think the most we can say is that the application should work on whatever processor architecture where I can run Kubernetes. Yes, uh, so uh, one comment because um, I add that chapter myself. So uh, I would say, uh, since it's a uh, CNF and it will be, uh, you know, agnostic to the architecture, to the infrastructure architecture, to the processor architecture. So for the CNF, I think it should be able to um, run on the ARM architecture as well without knowing what's the uh, unreleased uh, infrastructure. So that's the point I, I, I would like to uh, propose this such uh, chapter, okay? So I think that's also a, a basic uh, principle of the thing of to run on both the uh, X86 or the ARM architecture. So we can treat ARM as equally as the X86. Uh, mm -hmm. I totally agree on the goal for the um, ARM support. The question is, do we need to give so much space to something that is at least as obvious? Uh, I mean, it should be obvious that, that other architectures are supported. And we can mention that. Do we need to create a whole section for it? That's that's a different question. Uh, I think to me, to me, it sounds like if we wanted to do that, then we need a whole section on Intel as well. And then, then we are pretty much shifting the focus of the white paper into something that is very hardware specific. Agree. Yeah, I'd I'd prefer if we, like, having a line that says to support multiple architectures such as x86, ARM, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as opposed to having a, a section on this, and uh, and I think we should engage with the industry on a on a proper white paper on this because this is a really fascinating topic, and there's going to be a lot of implications on edge edge infrastructure as as we start to see more uh, data centers pop up on the edge, and many of them will be will be ARM or RISC or other similar platforms, and so, but I, I don't think we can do it justice here without defocusing the uh, the white paper. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. I, I'd back that up. But, but I'd also just point out this concept of chapters that um, just as putting in a paragraph and saying, hey, we're going to circle back to this in the future. Uh, Taylor and Denver and Lucina are actually now some of the at running um, multi-architecture containers through their work on CNCF.ci. And so um, it, they would be happy when the time's available to come back and talk about some of the lessons learned there and pitfalls and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, chapters is a fantastic idea as well. Uh, is I, I know CNTT does that, and so yeah, I, I think that's uh, a, good, so, a good place to do it too. Yeah, so uh, because uh, for the uh, white paper, uh, the, the structure of the white paper now only has the uh, chapter, so that I put it there. But um, well, if you guys think uh, there's uh, other place that better to you know to to uh, state this kind of um, support for the arm i think uh we, we can check that later but yeah it's uh, still um in progress i'd like to go with the suggested approach of of emphasizing the the, the hardware agnosticity and then then you know saying that that there is going to be more details on this because then i think if if we do something around hardware that that should be around node feature discovery and maybe use of smart mix and then you know different processor architectures then can get their own chapter but perhaps not in the very first white paper yeah because uh, I, I understand that uh, the transformation from the x86 or to arm or from arm to x86 are quite uh, 
uh, uh, time consuming work and there's a lot of uh, stuff uh, involved. So I think it, uh, we should mention it uh, somehow to uh, to remind people to understand they need to take that into consideration before they really um, you know implement some kind of application. So that uh, would maybe you know to, uh, to to save a lot of time and the money and the human resource. That's something I want to say. Because uh, yeah, everybody understands that army is important now, but uh, maybe they just didn't really think about it uh, during the development or the design time. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so then I I just for the sake of of differentiation, I color this arm chapter yellow, and uh, and the question is, does the rest suggested here sounds like a good scope for for the white paper for KubeCon because this would practically mean that ob obviously with some document editing uh, there would be two chapters that we could concentrate on and then maybe uh, if we could get uh, some participation from the operator community and 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 there, there could be two teams uh, running in parallel one working on on the on the goals and, and another one on design principles Yeah, at, at the very first, I think the first five, the intro up to the ideal CNF, I think would be good. Um, I think the importance of Etsy model management support is going to be a very interesting topic. And I think there's a lot more there that we're going to have to talk about. Than, that, uh, in terms of like, how does it fit in with, uh, with CNFs? And do we, do we need to drive existing Etsy infrastructure into into cnfs and my my reaction towards this at this point is we probably don't need the majority of what etsy uh, has but we need to make sure that we can integrate with it and i know others here also share uh, differing opinions on that as well so i think the first everything above that i think we can uh, we can get some clarity and like we, we have we have said i suspect we have some path that we can that we can drive and, and deliver on something I would also exclude the Etsy Mano uh, piece because, uh, as Fred said, it's, there's still too much discussion on that, and I don't think we will converge um, in time. Yes, and I, 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 don't, I don't have problems with uh, leaving that out for now. I have. I actually have problems leaving. I, I, I included that with a purpose, and my purpose with including that was that uh, no matter what we do to the CNFs, we somehow need to, to show continuity in the telco space about management. Uh, I think there has been a large amount of money spent towards uh, at CNFV in the past. Uh, and, and I think if we introduce a drastic change to the CNF itself, uh, we need to do that without a drastic and very costly change to the operational model of the operator. And so that that's why I thought it makes sense to have it here. Uh, it's good content as far as I'm concerned and, and it's relevant. But of course, if everybody says it should be out, no. I, I won't uh, be the one who will insist. Uh, no, actually, uh, I agree with you completely. Like, uh, uh, actually, the effort has done on the Etsy side and uh, like shouldn't be dropped, uh, especially like there are many operators in the market that has, uh, like, uh, want to keep the Etsy Mano architecture. So like this, we can't but, uh, out. So uh, I'm an operator, so uh, don't shoot me now. But uh, I totally agree with the fact that we should not include it for now. Uh, we have tried to, to implement this. Uh, everybody knows uh, the challenge we have right now with those kind of architectures and see why CNTT is still there. So the first five bullets are the key that are going to justify the glue of how we make that cloud native transformation how to make our network workloads look more like IT, knowing that the major differences might be the service impact afterwards, like a, a telco application moving into the cloud native, you still have criti critical application, they're, they're, they're supporting a critical function in our network. That might be more around that angle, we should, we should angle after that, more or less a technology, but they're day two service that needs to be relying on this. So, and Mano afterwards will be, uh, should be coming afterwards. Same for the hardware architecture like ARM. 
while we talk about something like this, there's some new technology that's being invented. So the, the underlying infrastructure will completely continuing evolve. The, the first five bullets are the more critical ones right now in my mind. The way that I see it is the first five bullets are the descriptive way of saying, here's what cloud native is. Here are all the benefits that you're going to get from it. And then if someone says, I like those, I would like to use it. Then you have this follow up and you say, how do I integrate it? Well, we need, we use, we follow Etsy standards. We need to integrate it there. We have arm in different parts of our network. We want to integrate it there. But the, the first white paper would be here are the benefits. Here's what you're going to get. Here's our goals. And then you can decide whether or not that even fits. If it fits, then you can go further in, look at the next papers. All right, that seems to sound uh, I said if everybody disagrees, I will not insist, so I will stop insisting. Um, good, so I think that's the content for now. And, um, and obviously, time is running very short, both for this meeting and both until KubeCon. So uh, I'd like to see if we could gather a, a very operative team that could start laying down some text. Now, then you have mentioned that uh, you, you, you will enlist someone who will do coordination on this work, right? Yeah, uh, Alex is actually going to do more than that. He's a, a very good writer and editor, and, and this is his primary focus for the next few weeks. So he's going to be diving in and looking to do phone calls and then, uh, you know, engagement via Google Docs with many mm -hmm. of you. So, so shall we contact him explicitly? Will he contact us? How will this work? Uh, it would be best if you can just ping him and me on Slack. It's Alex Salkeber. And uh, Taylor can put his name in the... Yeah, that um, would be great. Okay, we'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, and to, to, Tomas, I look forward to talking with you. Thank you for, for offering. So two quick uh, requests as well as first, uh, can we create a new Google Doc for each of these sections? Because the current Google Doc is getting unwieldy and hard to find through comments. And the second one is, uh, can we set up some times to discuss as a, as a community, uh, like once we have some pros written, to, to sit down and talk through these, uh, through these things to make sure that we get efficient? Because like we, we, have, we have about a month left and uh, we only have two meetings, one of which is at an uh, inconvenient time zone for, for many of the uh, United States authors. So uh, th th those would be the two requests. Do we want to set up a plea? Um, meeting to focus on the white paper. It would or at least not, on a... would not be bad. Like, I think we should write something first, but I think we should have, we should come together and have some meeting that we, that we join in on to discuss and make sure that we're, that we, we get as many ideas percolate through as possible. I think a meeting is not a bad All idea right. to have a to have some kind of a synchronization point, but I would rather like do the majority of the work via Slack. Like, let's not wait for for meetings to do stuff. It should reuse the. Completely meetings. agree, and I actually think we shouldn't even schedule anything until we've written something substantial as well, and that that gives an impetus to to actually write something. I, I, I agree with all of you. I think it's it's good to have a meeting where we agree who does what because time is limited and our resources are limited. So I think uh, if we can agree on on who does what, then we can you know use use our own resources to the best effect. That's why I think at least some meeting would be good to coordinate, and then we could go away and then just do the work.
All right. So I think uh, I think we got somewhere. Thank you very much for your input. Uh, uh, I, I, I have uh, contacted Alex offline, and then of course uh, you are very much encouraged to do the same. Uh, and then I think I'm done with my agenda point. Cool. I got to drop to another meeting, but uh, thank you all. Okay. Well, um, I guess push the rest of them. I think that the last one was updates um, from Muhammad on Etsy. Uh, we can push that to the next meeting if that's all right. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll follow up on Slack with regard to any new documents for the for the white paper uh, to work on those chapters as well as uh, follow up meetings uh, check and the CNCF tag channel for those. Thanks everyone. Thank you. The next uh, meeting next meeting is on October 21st. That's at 11 a.m. UTC or 7 p.m. China Standard Time. Cool. Understood. Thank you very Cheers. much. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.